Well, message titled, Giving the Gift of Truth. So I want to take a, a look at the, the, the thought of Christian giving. It goes right along with the testimonies that have come forth this morning. Um, but I want to say right up front that uh, the idea of, of the giving Christian is not a scheme to get more money from you. Uh, we've already taken the offering. We're going to take another offering, not today, but Wednesday we'll be taking another offering. But uh, besides all that, I want to show that there is a lot more behind giving than just money. Amen? Amen. There's a whole lot more to this idea of giving than money. And, and, and for, for example, uh, how many of you know who Bono is? Anybody know who Bono is? Bono, who's Bono? He's a singer, that's right. I didn't know if anybody would know that. But uh, anyway, uh, for many, his name instantly conjures up images of larger-than-life personality. Um, the brightest light, if you will, in a constellation of rock stars. But what you might not know is that this same guy, Bono, who, again, is the lead singer for the group U2, is an unabashed activist and is surprisingly different from the flashy image that he portrays. Behind his ever-present sunglasses are eyes that see the world clearly and a mind that grasps Spiritual realities. There was a book written about him titled Bono in conversation with Micah um, Assayas. And so in this book, he asks, he's asked about his faith, to which he replied, I'd be in big trouble if karma was going to be my final judge. <laughs> Amen. I'd be in big trouble. Oh, man. What is wrong with you people? I still got two, three hours preaching here. <laughs> wow, that watermelon looks good. Anyway. So he says, if karma was going to be my final judge, I'd be in big trouble. And he goes on to say that it does not excuse, it doesn't excuse my mistakes, but I'm holding out for grace. Amen. I'm holding out for grace. And uh, I'm holding out, he says, that Jesus took my sins at the cross because I know who I am and I hope I don't have to depend on my own religiosity. Asaias replied, the Son of God who takes away the sins of the world? I wish I could believe in that. And boldly and very unashamedly, Bono replied, the point of the death of Jesus Christ is that Christ took on uh, took on the sins of the world so that we put out so that what we put out did not come back to us and our sinful nature does not reap the obvious death this this guy has a grasp on spiritual reality and the reality of what Christ has done. It, it's not our own good works that get us through the gates of heaven, folks. It is not our own good works that get us through the gates of heaven. This journalist, true to his profession, was, was doing everything that he could to try and get some juicy comment or a, uh, something of a bold statement or a, a shocking statement. But what he got was way more bold and way more shocking than, than he had ever bargained for at all. In a matter of just a few mere moments, this rock star, who many of us wouldn't give the time of day to, frankly, 
because we don't know the backstory. We just know, hey, he's a rock star. He's got to be. Not necessarily, folks. But this guy just delivered to this reporter a flawlessly uh, given uh, gospel message about who Jesus was and what Jesus does. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter chapter 3. Starting in verse 15. Peter says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience. That when, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Listen, there's people that are going to do everything they can to try and throw you off. Try and rattle you. Try and get some kind of, of, of response other than something that would glorify God. Listen, I challenge you to, to get in God's Word and get in 1 Peter chapter 3 and these verses and, and understand them and read them and make them a part of your life, of who you are, and, and that the, you would know of your own testimony those things that God has done, like this guy does. When believers have Christ set apart in their heart, their courage that He gives us ought to make us always ready to testify about Him. We might not have sold a, a, a whole lot of water, but, but we had an opportunity, and Tammy and I talked about this a little bit. Boy, it was sure disappointing that we didn't have uh, you know, all those people, but I said, yeah, but you know what? We did get to minister to some, and that was the, that's the important thing. Amen. It's not about selling water. It's about getting an opportunity to minister. And Peter called upon the believers not to fear, but he doesn't stop there. And my challenge to you is don't be afraid of the gospel. Don't be afraid to give the gift of truth. Our faith ought to be active. Our faith ought to be ready to, to speak out. Now, not everybody's going to be tickled about you speaking out for the glory of God. Not everybody's going to be excited about that. I, I remember when, when I first started hearing about the gospel, I wasn't very excited about it either. Because it was challenging me and calling me out on some of my stupidity. Amen? Because when you're living like that, you don't want to be called out on it. Right? Am I the only one? Please don't let me be the only one. But once you begin to understand that you don't have to live that kind of life, that, that there's a, a full life. I didn't think you could have fun without being messed up. The bad thing about being messed up, other than the fact that you're messed up, is you don't remember the fun that you had the next day. And you have knots on your head and so, you know, you, you tip over and fall down and hurt yourself and do stupid things. How many of you watch the YouTube videos on, 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 on Yellowstone and the, the tourists that come through there and there's buffalo all over and they want to see how close they can get for a picture? How stupid is that? Let me tell you about your pastor. Before Jesus, okay? Before Jesus. I might have had a little bit to drink. And there might have been a ranch in Bly, Oregon called the BK Ranch. And they raised... Buffalo. And we were out running around and come across a pasture that was full of buffalo. And me and all of my wisdom decided I was going to get on the other side of the fence with the buffalo. I mean, he was a long ways out there. Okay, I'm not that stupid. 
And I got down on all four, looking right at him. And I started grabbing handfuls of grass and dirt and throwing it up over my shoulder, which, by the way, for the record, I do not advise that. Something about throwing grass upsets them a lot. And in about that quick, he was from out there to right there. And I never even touched the fence on my way out. I know I've had angels with me for a long, long time because one of them snatched me out of that field. And I was really, really sober, just like that. Stupid, stupid, stupid. I'm glad I got delivered from that. I could have been killed. It's bad. Our faith ought to be active. We ought to be ready to speak out. We ought to be prepared to give an answer to everybody that asks. Amen? We, we don't have to go all through life doing stupid stuff. There is a God that will set us free from that mess. Amen? And I'm thrilled to death that I had a meeting with Him. I'm thankful for little old ladies that refused to, to not pray for me. Amen? Amen? Never gave up. A man by the name of Robert Layton said this, He who can tell men what God has done for his soul is the likeliest to bring their souls to God. You know what I think would be healthy for us, church? Would be for us to sit down for a moment by ourselves, wherever you find your happy place, and begin to contemplate what it is that God has done in your life. What would my testimony sound like? If I was, to, if I was confronted with somebody, it, well, the, 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 the illustration that is often used is of someone being in a courtroom. And if you are in a courtroom and you are being charged with being, with, with, uh, being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? What would you say from, from the witness stand? How would you convey what Christ has done in your life to a jury of your peers? And I think it would do us well to take some time and begin to contemplate what it is that Christ has done. I'm reminded pretty regularly about the grace of God in my life. I don't, to this day, don't know why he hadn't killed me a long time ago. Amen? I just don't know. We need you. Well, I appreciate that. I, I, I do appreciate that. But it doesn't change the fact that I know in my, in my, in, that He's got to be a long-suffering God. He's got to be a God whose mercies truly are, are new every morning. That His love and His mercy endures forever. That listen folks, He did not screw it up when He chose you. He who can tell men what God has done for his soul is the likeliest to bring their souls to God. I asked this question a couple weeks ago. Uh, the, uh, who, who among us wants to at least be considered wise? Solomon was wise. The Bible says in Proverbs that the wise win souls. If you want to be, you don't have to be intellectually wise, but if you want to be considered wise, you just start winning people to Jesus. Just start winning people to Jesus. A lot of people have a hard time believing that there is truth to be found. Listen, truth is, is so screwed up in our world today. It is, just, um, it is just beyond my comprehension. If something is really good, now it's sick. Oh, that's sick. That's sick, man. No, that's good. No, it's sick. What in the world? Yeah. It, you're, it's messed up. Good is good, bad is bad. Sick, 
Nobody wants to be sick. Right? I mean, I don't, I don't think we do anyway. I sure don't. Many people are burdened by bad experiences or let down by life in some way, and they've been left with scars and suspicions. I was talking to somebody the other day about a guy that, that used to come to church, used to go to church all the time, but something happened somewhere along the line in church, and because of that, absolutely refuses to come to church, will not go to church. How sad is that? That's sad. I think sometimes we get our eyes too much off of God and too much on the people. I've got to find a good church. I've got to find the right church where people, you know, uh, that I can go to. If you, if you do, you'll screw it up. If you, if you find the perfect church and you start going there, you're going to screw it up. You understand what I'm saying? There is not a perfect church. There are not perfect people. We're all saved by the grace of God, period. Amen. Others are turned off by the very idea of absolute truth. Are you kidding me? Absolute truth. Yes, absolute truth. God's word is absolute truth. Well, I don't like it. Well, he didn't write it for you to like. He wrote it for us to follow. He does not need an editor. Some can see how, how one truth would be exclusive or transcendent above all the rest. And the, the, to the story is told of a man passing through a train station and when a bit of graffiti on the wall cut his eye, some evangelistic, evang an evangelistic vandal, if you will. An evangelistic vandal scrawled on the wall, Christ is the answer. Underneath those words, another script by another uh, tagger wrote this. Well, what's the question? And under that, another philosopher added his two cents to the, for the final commentary. Life is the question. Think about that. Think about that. Christ is the answer. What's the question? Life is the question. Three people in less than a dozen words have a profound discussion about a subject that touches every human being. If, if Christ is the answer, the answer to life itself, then there's no getting around the implication. If you and I don't connect with Christ, if we don't connect with Christ in some definitive way, how in the world can we hope to experience life in its fullest extent? We try and make more money to be happier. Money isn't the answer. I'm, man, I, I've, I've, I've made some money in my lifetime. And, and I was happier without a bunch of it. You know when you don't have a bunch of money, you don't have to have very high expectations about what you're going to get. Amen? I've had, I've had money. And I, don't get me wrong, I, I like the idea of having a little money. I like to be able to go and buy this and that if I want it. But it ain't the money that makes me happy. You know what makes us happiest with our money is the ability to bless somebody else with it. Amen? Right. Amen? I mean, that's the answer to it right there. You can have money and you'll have a lot of it. It depends on what you do with it. We have to connect with Christ in a definitive way if we're ever going to experience life in its fullest sense. I want to... I, you know the, the song, uh, He Walks With Me? It's about a guy named Andy. Right? right? right. Andy walks with me and a Andy talks with me. 
and he tells me I'm his. <laughs> Casey, it's all right. You can laugh. That, that was a good one. That was a good one. I want that kind of relationship with the Lord. Amen? I would love that. Listen, the disciples just before his death, Jesus is speaking to them in John chapter 14, in the first six verses, and this is what he says. Jesus is about to die, and this is what he says to his, to his disciples. Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. That's absolute truth, folks. And there's a multitude of people that don't like that absolute truth. Well, what about this way? Nope, that ain't the way. Well, what about over here? What if I do? No, no, there's one way, and it's through Jesus Christ. And people don't like that. They think it's narrow-minded. They think it's short Centered, it's, it's all this. That, listen, the fact that God made a way at all Amen. for us, church, Amen. ought to make us happy, happy. Amen. Amen. Amen? Can you hear in this passage the compassion in his voice? There's a lot of people that think God's just mad at them. I was one of them. For a lot of years of, of my life, even after I got saved, I thought for sure God was mad at me and he was looking for a way to kick me out of his kingdom. That's what I thought. Took me a long time to understand that he's doing way more to keep me attached than he is to keep, kick me out. I can hear the voice of one who's addressing his closest friends, and he knows that he's about to leave them, but not leave them helpless. But yet, it's hard to believe that Thomas was with him three years and still hadn't figured it out. Thomas blurts out, Lord, we don't know where you're going or how we know the way. He was saying to Thomas and the rest of the disciples, yes, you do know the way because you know me. I, I have a dear friend. He lives in Texas now. But I used to hunt with him every year. His name was John Cole. And John, the first day we hunted, John was the energizer bunny. I mean, he was up at the crack of dawn. He was packed up, ready to go. Didn't make any difference. And it was all you could do to keep up with John Cole for the first day. The second day, he's down. He can't do nothing. All he can do is lay in bed. And when, when uh, I'd get up and go hunting, and I'd come back, and John wouldn't be in camp. And so if John wasn't in camp, I knew that I needed to just look around because I knew John. And John was Boy Scout all the way. And you would look in the dirt and you'd see arrows. I went this way, H2O. He went for water. Or there would be arrows made out of sticks. I always knew where John was. I didn't have to know physically exact, but I knew where he was because I knew John, and I knew every time that was going to be the result. That guy was an amazing, amazing guy. And, and, and I, know, I knew the way that he was going because he left these little signs everywhere. And I can tell you, church, the Lord has left us plenty of signs. 
Look at what it says in John chapter 18, verse 37 and 38. Jesus is about to be crucified. He's before Pilate. And Pilate says to him in verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? This idea of truth is not a new, uh, a, a new concept. Pilate is asking, well, what is truth? Pilate makes four attempts in, in chapter 18 and chapter 19. He makes four attempts to deal with Jesus. The first thing he does in, verse, in chapter 18 and verse 31, and I don't have these, you can look them up. He tries to put the responsibility on someone else. He's, he's, he's petitioning the crowd. Do you want Jesus or do you want Barabbas? He's trying to shift the blame. He's trying to, to put the responsibility on someone else. And the second thing that he does is he tries to find a way of escape so that he can in fact release Jesus in verse 39 of chapter 18. And the third thing he does is he tries to compromise which a lot of us are in that place right there. We try and compromise. Pilate tried to compromise with having Jesus flogged rather than handing Him over to die. He thought that would... I'll just have Him beat. Maybe that'll satisfy Him. Well, it didn't satisfy Him. The fourth thing that he did was he tried a direct appeal to the sympathy in chapter 19 and verse 15. He tried a direct appeal to the sympathy of the accusers. Listen, I can't find anything wrong with this guy. I can't find any, anything, any, any reason. And he said, he, at one point he said, you guys crucify him. And they said, we can't crucify him. You have to do it. Everybody has to decide, church. Every one of you, from the youngest to the oldest, everybody has to decide what to do with Jesus. Everybody has to decide what to do with Jesus. Whatever, Pilate desi whatever desire Pilate had to free Jesus was negated by his refusal to do so. Don't forget who Pilate was. He, the, he was the man with authority. But you know what his downfall was? He wanted to please people instead of God. He would rather please people than do the right thing. And folks, you're going to come to a place in your life where you have to make a decision. Am I going to please God or am I going to maybe please man? And that's a tough place to find yourself in. Um... Pilate let everybody else decide for him, and in the end, he lost. In the end, he lost. Jesus said, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. It's as categorical and straightforward as you can get, but Jesus said it, and we have to deal with it. The surest place for you and I to find truth is in God's Word. Not from your brother, not from your friend, from God's Word. We, we live in a very fast-paced society now, and we don't want to spend the time looking in God's Word to see what God's Word says. It's easier to just Google it or talk to somebody on, uh, you know, on the phone and, and, and get their idea. Listen, their idea might be way off from what the Bible says, but you like them a lot, you trust them a lot, so you believe what they say, and in, in a very short time, we can be headed down a wrong path, folks. That's why we've got to stay close to God's Word. 
Jesus said those things, we have to deal with them. There's no room for compromise or halfway positions. I was talking to somebody this morning, I can't remember who it was, about, about truth. And, and half the gospel. But half the truth's a whole lie. You can't have just a little bit of truth in the midst of chaos. The truth is the truth. Amen? Well, it's, just a, it's just a little, it's just a little uh, discoloration. It's just a little off-key, if you will. Well, what if I make a cake and put just a little dog doo-doo in it? It's just a little. It's just, it's just a little. What's the problem? There ain't one of us in this room that would eat that cake. But yet we mess around with this idea of absolute truth. And we need to not do it. I know that's a shocking illustration, but you probably won't forget it. Which is my plan. In Ma- <laughs> Sorry. Do you still do you still need me that bad? <laughs> in, in in Matthew chapter twelve and verse thirty, this is what it says: He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Man, that makes that get that's getting it pretty plain, isn't it? Separating North Vietnam from South during more than a decade of battle was this area called the demilitarized zone. Some of you just pictured that in your mind having been there and having fought there. And we're grateful for your service and we thank you for that. This place called the demilitarized zone was a kind of no man's land. It was burnt over and it was barren. See, rivers and mountains and man-made walls have served the same purpose. Neutral open space where both sides watch and neither stakes out a claim. I remember in the scripture where, where the, the whole Philistine army was on this side of the valley and, and the, the, God's army was on the other side of the valley and nobody was making advances on the other. And, and Goliath would come out every day and he'd begin to rant and rave and say all these kinds of things. And, and finally, a, a young shepherd boy named David showed up. And he heard all this that was going on. And David asks of the, of the, of the, the, the military leaders, Saul, his brothers, the generals, he's, he, who is this guy? Who is, well, actually what he said was, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies? Of the, and the army of God was, they're shaking it, their knees are knocking. I mean, they're scared to death. David said, listen, I've killed the bear and I've killed the lions. I've protected my father's sheep. And this Philistine is going to be just like one of them. And he took off. And he grabbed uh, five smooth stones. It's not because he was a bad shot. Hello. It was because Goliath had brothers. And he was just as apt to take them all out as one. And, And Goliath hurled all these insults at David. Well, you're just a snot nosed little kid. I'm paraphrasing. I don't know what translation you find this in, but that's kind of what he said. You're just a snot-nosed kid who, who in the, today I'm going to feed your body to the buzzards. And David said, I don't think so, Tim. And he pulled out a stone and he put it in a sling and whap. He took him out. And all of a sudden, no man's land was filled with battle. 
because somebody made a decision. And the question this morning that I have for you is, are you ready to make a decision? No such space exists in the spiritual battle that is waged between God and Satan. And the Bible tells us that truth is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. If you want to know what truth is, get to know Jesus. And I'm not talking about as a Bible character. I'm talking about get to know him personally, on a first name basis. In who he was, what he said, find out what he did. Find, to find him is to find the way. To know him is to know the truth. And to have him is to have life itself in reality. See, the gospel is literally the good news. It, it is the message of His redeeming sacrificial love. I look back over my life, and I don't have to look very far to become very thankful for what God's done in my life. Man, I'll tell you what, I, I wouldn't have given you a plug nickel for me, but Christ did. I'm grateful for it. So in receiving and believing the message and trusting in Him, a person receives the gift of God, which is eternal life. So listen to this. The essence of giving truth is literally giving Christ. The essence of giving truth is giving Christ. When we communicate to someone His story, His message, His relevance, we are communicating truth. It isn't truth because I said so. It's truth because He said so. Jesus declared boldly, I am the truth. So for the giving Christian, the, crest, the question is, how can I clearly and most effectively communicate truth by giving Christ to another person? Well... Like I said before, you need, to, you need to sit down and you need, to, you need to take inventory of what the Lord has done in your life. You need to begin to formulate some, some type of plan to, to give your testimony. Your testimony is the best sermon you have. After the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863... Abraham Lincoln was meeting with a group of newly freed slaves when one of them knelt at his feet to thank him. The president reached down, took the man by the hand and brought him to his feet. And he said this, he said, please do not bow to me. I'm just a man like you. And we both should bow only to the one who created us and truly gives us our freedom. Abraham, Abraham Lincoln had a keen understanding of truth. He could look into the face of a former slave and know that in God's eyes there was no difference. There was no difference. They were both in need of the freedom that only Christ can give. Amen? So the question that I have this morning, if you want to come to the piano is this. Has the truth set you free this morning? Amen. For some of us, if we really embrace the truth, it will begin to hinder our lifestyle. And that's a <laughs> if we really embrace the truth, it will, it will change our life. And, and sadly, oftentimes we don't want that change because we kind of like the way some things are. We, we like the idea of making heaven our home, but I really like the idea of not having to change too much in my life. Which flies in the face of absolute truth. Has the truth set you free? If so, then you need to be talking about it. 
Talk about it to your, your friends, your neighbors, your family. Give that truth to the people who you meet on life's pathway. Let them know the reason for the hope that you have. How tragic it would be for somebody to have a cure for uh, cancer, uh, all kinds of cancer, and then not tell anybody, not share it. How, that would be devastating, wouldn't it? God, God has given us His Word, not just so that we have something to read. God has given us His Word to guide our lives, to transform our lives. To give us all the ammo that we need to win the war. Bow your heads with me this morning. Absolute truth is just that. It's absolute truth. It's pure. It's not meant to ruin your life. It's meant to help your life. Whom the Son sets free, the Bible says, is free indeed. This morning, my prayer is that every one of us would have that assurance in our life that Jesus Christ loves us, died for us. We've asked Him to forgive us. And more than just asking Him to forgive us, we're walking in the forgiveness that He has given us. We're being gracious to those that we come in contact with. We're giving out mercy where mercy is needed. Who is it in your life this morning that needs to hear about Jesus? You might be the only person that they'll listen to. And they're waiting. They're waiting on you. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're watching by way of the internet. And you, you're questioning in, your, in yourself right now this idea of absolute truth. Listen, I've, I've messed my life up enough to know that God is compassionate. And God is all about do-overs. He's a God of mercy and a compassion and grace. He's just asking this morning, will you take the first step? The first step to getting your need met is admitting that you have a need. God, I have a need this morning. I need a closer walk with you. God, I need you to come into my life. I need you to forgive me of my sin. I need you to show me today, God, that I can still have tons of fun without doing things that would jeopardize eternity. God, I pray this morning for your church. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would just begin to impart into each one of us a desire to be closer to you, to walk with you, to commune with you, to fellowship with you. God, I'm not perfect by any stretch but I love you with my whole heart. And I'm praying that God, that you'll help me to walk close to you. If there's anybody here today that says, 
say, Pastor, I, I, I have never accepted the Lord into my life, but I sure want to today. I, I want to know that. If that's you, if you'll slip your hand up, I'll pray with you. I promise this church will pray with you. Anybody at all, maybe you're watching by way of the internet and you say, Preacher, I, I've never accepted Jesus. Listen, it's as simple as, as, as asking the Lord to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Tell Him you're sorry. Ask Him to help you change your life. And He'll do it. It's not a big, long, drawn-out process. It's pretty simple. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you shall be saved. That's His Word. Please show us, Lord, every day. Teaching us new ways. Help us, Lord, to live for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. If you'll just give us a few moments now, we're going to... Uh, set things up who's in charge who can I point people to Glenda Glenda she left she's outside Glenda left <laughs> don't run off everybody alright I'm going to go start cooking